We are going to start with no further ado with John Spencer, and I want to welcome John. John is a former middle school teacher and current college professor who is on a quest, much like all of us, to transform schools into the bastions of creativity and wonder. I love wonder. You know why I love wonder as a researcher. Wonder is one of those things that research has shown can close the gap. It closes the gap with kids who come from backgrounds that aren't as privileged as others. So we're going to hear from John, and then I'll be back up to tell you about our next speaker. So please welcome John Spencer with me. We're excited to have him back. Let me just double check. Is it showing up yet? Cool. Awesome. Let's get started. So the Astrodome was a modern miracle. It had the perfect glass ceiling that would allow you to play baseball indoors. No more worrying about the weather. No more worrying about the outside context. It had perfect symmetry. It was modern. It was the space age stadium. It was supposed to be the future of baseball. In fact, most of the reporters kept calling it the eighth wonder of the world. This was the future. Until it wasn't. Because, it, see, it, it turned out that when you had this glass ceiling, as cool as it looked, baseball players couldn't catch the ball. It would be blinding the moment that they looked up and they couldn't see it and they would drop the ball every time. And so they had a solution. Let's paint the ceiling tiles to make it darker. But it turns out that grass needs this thing called light for photosynthesis. And so the grass died. So they had to come up with a solution. AstroTurf. And then for the next 20 years, more and more stadiums began to fit the mold of the AstroDome. Circular, concrete donuts with AstroTurf, perfect symmetry, modern, space-aged. But the reality is AstroTurf didn't work very well. Players kept getting hurt. The stadiums were actually kind of boring to go to. All of this stuff that was designed to be perfect and futuristic didn't make baseball any better to watch as a fan. Now, if you're not a fan of baseball, trust me, I'm not going to talk about baseball the whole time. I promise. But to me, this is a lesson. The Astrodome wasn't built for baseball. It was built for the future. They didn't think about the fans. They didn't think about the context. They didn't think about the players. They thought about how do we create a space-aged, futuristic stadium, right? The kind that could win the Cold War. And right around the time that the Astrodome was old and obsolete and fans weren't showing up and it was becoming more and more dangerous to play there, somebody had a solution. What if we go vintage? What if we completely change the way we do baseball? And so they came up with something called Camden Yards. Camden Yards was the idea of an old-fashioned traditional baseball park with modern amenities. It was the idea of looking forward by looking backwards. They borrowed ideas, which is a nice way of saying still, right? They stole lots of great ideas from old stadiums. They would look back at Wrigley Field and Fenway Park and Scheib Park, the Polo Grounds, Ebbets Field, all these places that were quirky and fun and different. And they incorporated those elements into their design. See, they redefined relevance not as being up to date or cutting edge or futuristic, but relevant was all about being different. Sometimes the very thing you need to pull you into the future 
is to look back into the past. That was the core idea. Instead of saying, let's go with perfect symmetry and the best design, they said, wait a second, what if we incorporate that factory, that old factory, and use that as part of our design? We've got a weird looking lot in downtown Baltimore. What if we incorporated the stadium into that lot and built it around the style and the feel of the community? And that, as a design idea, is the core idea of vintage innovation. Vintage innovation is that middle zone between best practices and next practices. It's the idea of embracing the lo-fi and the high tech. It's the idea of saying, you know what, we should, we should pay attention to the try and true, but we should also innovate and try out the never tried at the same time. All right, so that's baseball. But what does this have to do with education? I would argue that it has everything to do with education. I want to share a story briefly about my own childhood experience and a contrast of two different teachers I had in the eighth grade. So a little background information. I was born in the Ice Age, where I learned how to stop and collaborate and listen. If you had told me as a child that ice tea would play a cop on television, I would not have believed you. It was at a time when this bad boy was considered cutting edge, and the biggest technology concern I had was to not get dysentery. That was the old school computer virus, right? And I remember in the eighth grade, I had a teacher, and he stood up and he actually called us up to the front of the room and he held out this golden disc and he said, this will change learning forever. This will transform your education. Someday you're going to walk into a classroom and you're just going to pick up one of these laser discs and it's going to give you all the information you need. And then I remember him saying, and and one of the the coolest pieces of this is, is, These laser discs will allow you to learn all that you need, and you won't need to have a teacher anymore. And to me, that was kind of sad because I loved this teacher. He was funny. He was interesting. We would learn random things on the spot that were off script. I didn't want a golden disc. I wanted a person. I wanted a human. And although that seems laughable right now, The reality is, it did not transform education. Years later, my kids, my own kids, do not show up to school and pick up a golden disc that's replaced them. In fact, when I asked them about it, they did not know what a laser disc was. But I mention this because technology will never transform the learning. Teachers will. And I say this because I have seen promises over and over again. Oh, an adaptive learning program. Oh, one-to-one will change and transform learning. Oh, AI will transform learning. But the reality is it will always come down to that dynamic relationship between teachers and students. And I mention this because that same year I had this teacher, Mrs. Smoot. And this was me in the eighth grade. Had a slightly different hairline. And she was different. She knew me as a person. She knew that I cared about issues in our society. She knew that I totally geeked out on baseball and that I loved history. And so Mrs. Smoot didn't promise a golden disc to replace her. She didn't promise any of that. All she said was, I know you, I know that you're into this, and I want to challenge you to do a National History Day project. And she kind of had to sell it to me because I was that kid who was really good at playing the game of school. I got A's in classes that I liked. I got B's in classes that I didn't care about. And I knew as long as I didn't get a C, my parents were happy. And with great inflation, that was pretty easy to do, right? 
And suddenly I have this teacher who says, I want you to do something totally different. You're going to have no homework. Every fifth day, you're going to be excused from class to work on this project. And it can be any topic that you want. You're going to spend the whole year working on this. And because I didn't particularly love homework, I thought, yeah, you know what? I can do this. So I signed it up. And I said, I will do this History Day project, but I will not present to the district. And so I went ahead and I began to work on the project. And it was fun at first, but it was also absolutely terrifying. I went through the research process. I asked questions. I owned the entire process. And in the end, I had to actually talk to people. I interviewed former baseball players. There were, uh, the, the topic I chose was Jackie Robinson, the integration of baseball. And I remember being so terrified to talk to strangers. I would get on the phone and I would whisper talk. I would be like, I'm John Spencer. And of course, on the other side, they're thinking, holy crap, I'm going to die, right? Someone's whisper talking to me. I would hang up half the time, then I have to call back, which is really endearing. Because I was this shy, introverted kid who was suddenly having to learn the soft skill of communication. I remember when I was doing the research, I didn't know, do you want note cards? Do you want binders? Do you want whatever? And she said, use whatever process works best for you. I remember moments where I couldn't find an answer and I was so frustrated. I just wanted her to give me the answer and I didn't know it at the time, but she was absolutely teaching me a lesson. It was grit. The bottom line is this was personalized learning. It just didn't have a lot of technology involved. And I mention all of this because the hardest moment was when I finally recorded my script I was doing a slide presentation, and I was so nervous that, it, that the, the moment that I heard my voice, and I said to Mrs. Smoot, I am not going to share this with any audience. And I remember that was the moment she said, when you hide your voice, you rob the world of your creativity, and I'm not going to let you do that. And the reality is the laser disc could have told me the exact same thing, but I would not have trusted that laser disc, right? It required a relationship. It required a person. It required a teacher who cared about me and who I knew cared about me. Now, I mention all of this because the technology is now obsolete. I have a whole set of skills I will never use. I can unjam a projector like nobody's business. Nobody cares. I know how to navigate the dark art of microfilm and microfiche. Nobody cares. I can time my long distance phone calls because it costs money, but it doesn't cost money anymore, so it doesn't matter. I can splice together audio using a razor blade and scotch tape. Nobody cares, right? The technology skills are completely obsolete. But the other skills, the thinking skills, the soft skills, those skills are timeless. That was the year I learned how to communicate. That was the year that I learned how to face my fears and talk to strangers. That was the year that I learned how to engage in deep and meaningful research and interview people who were different from me. That was the year I realized that the integration of baseball was a lot more complicated than what I thought. That actually the story of Jackie Robinson is beautiful and amazing, but it was also a time where a lot of black-owned businesses went out of business in the case of the Negro Leagues. It was a time of learning nuance and new perspectives. In other words, it was a whole year of these soft skills that have lasted forever. And I mention this because our world is changing if we just take our devices, all of this stuff that we have required actual physical stuff back in the day. My kids will never know the struggle 
of standing in front of the boombox with your finger on the record button trying to make that epic mixtape, right? That Nirvana, Pearl Jam, just kidding, it was totally boys to men. But, but that's okay. Now they just say, Alexa, play my favorite song. And she plays it. Right? Before Siri or Alexa, there was Clippy. And Clippy was this really obnoxious paperclip. It was like a backseat driver of Word documents telling you exactly, oh, so you want to write a letter? Good luck. Let's see how you do. We have this amazing creative and connective power at the palm of our hands that I could not have imagined as a child. It's just the beginning. We have artificial intelligence and big data, virtual reality, augmented reality, and there's a tendency when we see all these changes as educators to jump into futurism. More coding classes, 3D printers, higher tech maker spaces. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But the reality is a makerspace is great, but so is a garden. Some of the biggest changes happening in robotics come from studying ants and termites. Right? There's this whole concept of biomimicry and the way studying nature impacts design. In fact, if you think about the future of space travel, it's hard to believe this. But the two biggest changes happening in space travel come from studying gecko feet to understand adhesives and doing origami. That's vintage, right? Origami. So if we think about this, we need those vintage elements. We can't predict the future. There's no way I, as a kid I would have ever been able to predict, for example, that I would spend my free time chasing imaginary monsters, capturing them so I could level up, right? I do play Pokemon Go, unabashedly so. So what do we do with this? I think the best way to prepare students for the future is by empowering them in the present. It's the idea that we say, there are elements of the future, yes, that we should focus on, but there are these vintage elements that are more relevant than ever. It's what happens when we ask about what are those old ideas that we can incorporate in a new context? What are those old materials that we can mash up with new materials to create something entirely different? What are those constraints that we could work within to innovate and design? realized there is no audio. I'm so sorry. Microphone thing's gone. All right. I'll have to move from that. So the bottom line is this. There's nothing wrong with technology. It is great. But in the end, gadgets will break. Technology is going to go obsolete. The things that we think are relevant 10 years from now won't be. That's the astronome. But teachers will always be the ones who will transform the world and make a difference in students' lives. Thanks.